Right, we continue our series from Isaiah, and it's interesting because the, um, uh, the next section, Isaiah 7 to 11, but there's a number of readings there that turn up often at Christmas time. And at Christmas time, we're thinking these uh, prophecies are all about Jesus. That's all exciting. And it's a you know, Christmas story and uh, it's all the happiness and whatever. But we don't realize the context, the background of what was Isaiah prophesying in what was his timeline. So Isaiah does a lot of his prophecies during a war zone. And it's a time when both Israel and Judah, the north and the south, had both fallen away from God and were heavily involved in idolatry and they were at conflict and at war with each other. As a matter of fact, for many people, it's one of the darkest and one of the messiest times in Israel Judah's history. And so when we see these prophecies about Christmas, Isaiah gave them to the nation of uh, Israel at one of its darkest moments as a time and uh, as words of hope. So let's uh, look at the key problem, the key issue. So we find there in chapter uh, 7 verses 1 and 2, the northern nation of Israel and uh, Syria had combined to, uh, to attack. And when King Ahaz was king of Judah, said King Rezim of Syria, and Pekah was the king of Israel. Now Ahaz was an incredibly wicked king. He worshipped other gods than the true God. And he even sacrificed his son to the god Moloch. You imagine the horror. You have a husband and wife, they marry. They've got the excitement of her being pregnant with the first child. And she, her, her tongue gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the day that she gives birth to the child. And the first thing you do with this brand new baby is kill it and offer it to a god. Now what damage would that do to a family? So this king has his cowardly... He's superstitious, he's hypocritical, and he's possibly one of the worst kings Judah had ever had. So this is the time that Isaiah is preaching at. Now we find here that uh, the attack on Jerusalem was ultimately unsuccessful they wanted to do. But the war against Judah had taken a great toll on both countries. It says here in the uh, southern uh, kingdom, in 2 Chronicles 28, that Pekah had killed a hundred and 20,000 people in Judah because they had forsaken God. And then in 2 Chronicles 28, it says the Syrian armies had carried away a multitude of captives. And it says the king of Israel had captured 200,000 men, women and children, but sent them back to Judah after the command of the prophet Oded. So Syria and Judah had both set out to attack Jerusalem. However, they were unable to carry out their plan. Why? Because Ahaz had entered into an incredibly ungodly alliance with the king of Syria and uh, had even given the king of Syria a whole lot of silver and gold that he'd taken from the temple to win his favour and to win his protection. So the money that had been set aside for God's work was now being used to give to a foreign power. And Ahaz went to meet with uh, Tilglath uh, uh, Pilsa, his new master, and he saw all the pagan altars and he got so excited. What does he do? He comes back to Jerusalem, goes into the temple that is meant to be for God and turns all the architecture into a, uh, that of being a pagan temple and introduces a whole of pagan altars. So Ahaz is a powerful, extreme example of someone who creates an ungodly alliance for good reasons in his eyes, but was thoroughly corrupt. So this is when Isaiah is preaching. So Isaiah goes to this King Ahaz. They're in chapter 7, verse 3. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and meet King Ahaz. And you're thinking, here's this godly prophet Isaiah. What are we going to say to such a corrupt king? And uh, God tells Isaiah to say this in verse 4. Tell him to stop worrying. Tell him he doesn't need to fear the fierce anger of those two burnt out embers, King Rezin of Syria and Pekah which of course was of Judah. Then in verse 7, this invasion will never happen. It will never take place. So Isaiah's word to him was this, take heed, be quiet, because uh, Ahaz seemingly had paid more attention to his problems than to God who could help him. So Isaiah basically says to him, you need to trust God. Take courage in the Lord. And then in chapter 7, verse 8, he uh, gives him these words of encouragement. Syria is no stronger than its capital, Damascus. 
And Damascus is no stronger than its king Rezin. And as for Israel, within 65 years, it will be crushed and completely destroyed. So there is in the middle of this battle thinking, you know, who's going to win? What's going to happen? It says, don't worry, within a couple of years' time, they will be totally wiped out. Israel is no stronger than its capital, uh, Syria, uh, uh, Samaria, and Samaria is no stronger than its capital, uh, King Pekah. Unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. And then he goes, says in verse, um, uh, verse uh, 10, Later the Lord said this as a message to King Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign of confirmation, Ahaz. Make it as difficult as you want, as high as heaven or as deep as the place of the dead. So in other words, God's saying, test me. I'm ready. I'm faithful. I'm secure. But the king refuses. He says, no, I will not test the Lord like that. And it's not a false humility because there's this arrogance there. Then in verse 13, Isaiah says, Listen well, you royal family of David, isn't it enough to exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of God as well? And Israel spoke to the immediate, but also to the eternal. So what, is that, what does he speak about here as Isaiah? It says in verse 14, All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign and look. So he didn't want a sign, but God says, I'm going to give you a sign. And what's the sign? The very verse that we always use at Christmas time. There in chapter 7, verse 14. The virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and he'll be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Then verse 15. By the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, he'll be eating yogurt and honey. For before the child is that old, the land of the two kings you fear so much will both be deserted. So here he is in the midst of this battle thinking, what's going to happen? And God says, it's in my hands. These people won't last forever. As a matter of fact, at some point, they will be just dust. So what's his response? There in chapter 7, 24. It says, the entire land will become a vast expanse of thorns, a honey ground overrun by wildlife. No one will go to the fertile hillsides where the gardens once grew, for briars and thorns will cover them. Cattle, sheep and goats will graze there. So there's a sense that God is saying, this enemy of yours will face my judgment. And as we go for the next couple of chapters, Isaiah keeps on giving him words of hope and words of encouragement at the time when Israel was at its darkest. So there in chapter 9, we turn to chapter 9 next, and verse 2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And once more, Christmas promise. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And this glorious prom promise here, and this prophecy, is the birth of Messiah. To remind Israel that the victory-bringing Messiah will be a man. That God will send somebody. And it's amazing, Mishra, because it's not just the man. That God says, I will send you someone who is weak, and what is more weak and helpless than a baby? That the man... The Messiah who's coming will come to you as a weak, young, helpless baby. Now, theoretically, God could have sent uh, an angel to be uh, his representative on earth. He'd done that before. Huh? But he said, no, I'll send you a man. Now, it could have been like Adam, where he just makes uh, Jesus a fully grown man that turns up on earth. He says, no. I'll get Jesus to be born as a child. He will live his life as a child. Why? Because Jesus can fully identify with our humanity and display his servant nature in the fact that he is God, but he's taken that of servanthood and taken that the life of a man. So what do we have in Jesus? We have Jesus who is 100% God, 100% human. He fulfills everything of divinity and everything of humanity. What does that mean? Jesus is our perfect government twin. He can represent us because he's like us in every way. He can represent God because he's like God in every way. He's a perfect step between the two. So he fully represents us and fully represents God. And as we look at this verse here about Jesus coming to earth as a man, it reminds us that our problem isn't our humanity. 
Our problem for you and I is our fallenness. Who's ever heard the statement, when you make a mistake, say, well, I'm only human. You know, it's like the classic thing you say, well, I'm only human, as if you know, that's why I've done it. Well, see, Jesus was human. The problem is not our humanity. What we should be wisely saying is not that I am human, but I am fallen or I am a sinner. So what's the next part of it saying there? It says, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful, which means he will fill our heart with amazement and counselor because Jesus is the one who is fit to guide you and I. For us to say, dear God, help me, guide me, give me direction is probably the best prayer that any of us can ever pray. It then goes on to describe him in Isaiah as mighty God. And this one of the clearest statements in Scripture of the absolute divinity and deity of Jesus. He was not just a good person. He was God's son. The next line uh, has been one that's always strong because it says that Jesus is everlasting father. And people know he's not everlasting father. He's everlasting son. But why does it use the term father? It's to do with the Hebrew idea of words. That Jesus is the author of all eternity, which is the idea of being father, and in other words, control of all things. In other words, there's another way of saying that Jesus is our creator. It doesn't mean that Jesus himself is uh, God the Father, and it doesn't uh, mix up the first and second person of the Trinity, but it uses the term uh, everlasting father of that of creator, or one who starts things. The next uh, thing in Isaiah describes him as the Prince of Peace. And here we have uh, Israel, Judah, Syria at war with each other. Syria comes in as a, a power player. They're in a world of conflict. Thousands, tens of thousands have been uh, killed and damaged. And so what does it mean for him to be Prince of Peace? He's going to be about the greatest peace, the peace between us and God. There will be wars and rumours of wars in all countries. But it's us and God and our peace with God in heaven that's the most crucial one to get right. Then in verse 7 it says, Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And King Ahaz was of David's family, but what a rotten king they had. And it's saying the Messiah will come as the true king. Ahaz uh, failed in so many ways, but Jesus will not. We can turn now to uh, the third section, Isaiah 11, which once more captures us a whole of the prophecies about Jesus. Remember, all these prophecies were being given in the midst of war and conflict, in the midst of idolatry and immorality, in the midst of where people would offer their children to false gods and worship false gods. What does God say to us in Isaiah 11 verse 1? Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. Jesus did come from the, uh, the stump of Jesse. And the royal authority of the house of David had lain dormant for 600 years when Jesus became the king and Messiah in Israel. When Jesus came forth, it was like a brand new branch that was green and lush that had grown out of an apparently dead stump. Now, uh, I love chopping down different uh, trees at different times. And it's interesting, sometimes you, you chop down a tree, you think, fantastic, it's gone. And suddenly, out of that uh, stump comes up a, a, a sapling. You think, you wretched, and you cut that down. And there are times that you, uh, it's not just out of a fresh stump, but sometimes the stump can look absolutely dead, and something, something grows out of it, thinking, well, where'd that come from? And this is what God's going to say to us. At the moment, you're thinking, where has everything has happened? Everything's falling apart. Everything's in disaster mode. But God is in the midst of that. And Jesus comes as a branch that is full of life, full of hope, and empowered by the Spirit of God. That which was apparently dead has been made alive and fresh and new. He goes on in uh, verse 2 to use the concept of the Spirit. And it talks about Jesus. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Jesus, will rest on him. It says uh, seven things. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And then describes to us what Jesus will be like. 
He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance, nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor, make fair decisions to the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. This is so opposite to King Ahaz, who is ruling their times. Jesus will be just. Jesus will be fair. He'll be merciful. He'll be loving. And he'll be all-powerful, and he'll have authority. But most significantly, Jesus will come to transform our world. Then it goes on in verse 5 to describe Jesus even further in the book of Isaiah. He will wear righteousness like a belt, truth like an undergarment, and in those days the wolf and the lamb will lie together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all. The cow, cow will graze near the bear, the calf and the cub will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow, and the baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put her hand into the nest of deadly snakes without harm. What a transformation has been described for us here. Jesus, when he comes to earth, will change everything. The Prince of Peace will be peace and bring peace. Isaiah, who's living in the midst of idolatry, speaks of God coming as a living man to earth to bring peace. At a time when dumb idols filled the temple, Jesus, the living God, will walk among them as God. And the most important peace between man and God will be achieved, achieved and everything will be changed. It's interesting... Uh, I hope I haven't told you this story before because I'm after three years, stories do repeat themselves. But uh, when I was at Kellyville High, I had a lovely Iranian girl who uh, made a sta statement of faith. She had been a Muslim. Uh, her, it was interesting, we used to joke about cars, said, oh, my dad's got a Lamborghini. And he would say, of course he doesn't. No one has a Lamborghini. The next day she came to school and had a photo in the garage was the Lamborghini that her dad had brought over in America, brought her over to Australia, just sat there in the garage doing nothing. But uh, so successful family. Her dad was one of the head uh, people in one of the major banks in Australia. And she's Muslim. And the thought is, what do you do? Because do I tell mum and dad? I said, well, don't tell your parents you become a Christian. Wait till they ask you. And you kind of think, well, how would they ask you if you haven't told them anything? About six, seven weeks later, her father calls her into his study. He's on one side of the desk and she's on the other. He closes the door behind her. And he says to her, Mother and I are quite concerned about you. We're very worried. We've noticed in the last couple of weeks that you make your bed. You do the dishes. You help around the house. You're polite to Mother and I. And you're being nice to your brother and sister. What has happened? She answers. I have become a Christian. <clears throat> he says, well, I need to talk to your mother about this, won't I? And she leaves the room. Wondering what's going to happen next. A couple of days later, she's called in to talk to her mother and father in a very formal setting. And they say, we love what has happened to you. Would you like us to send you to a Christian school? God changes people. God changes hearts. God changes souls. He's in the business of transforming people. In 2 Corinthians 5 it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. And behold, the new has come. 
In Galatians it says in chapter 6, there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. In Colossians 3, put on the very new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and you need to become like him. When Romans 8, for the law of the spirit of life is Jesus Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. In King Ahaz's time, there was immorality, there was persecution, uh, there was uh, 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 false gods being worshipped in the temple, there was wars, there was famines. It was just disaster. But God says, I'm coming to give you a new life beyond the expectations of what's surrounding you. So we've got a great promise we have, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. For God is so rich in mercy, and he's loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Jesus from the dead. If Jesus can come as a branch from a stump, how much more can God change us? These verses here in Isaiah were written in a very dark time. But they're written as verses of confidence and hope. That wasn't seen in Isaiah's time. As a matter of fact, the answer did not come for another 600 years. But there's a sense that God is working in the here and now, in our day to day. And we have no idea what his sovereign hand is doing in our life. There are times we say, dear God, please answer me today. And he says, no, I'm going to give you patience first. God uses our circumstances for his glory. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father God, in the time when Israel was at its darkest, you gave some of those powerful verses of hope to Isaiah. Father, remind us in our here and now, here on earth, that you are in control of all things. That you love us, that even though we were dead because of our sins, that you've given us new life through the risen Christ. Father God, may your Holy Spirit mould us and change us and renew us day by day. Amen.